Okay, so um, I haven't gotten very far in this lecture. So is this space okay? Uh, is this should I speed up or slow down? Is it understandable at this pace? No, I agree. No, I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. So Johansson proved something even more incredible. So he was able to find the second asymptotic of this last passage time and was able to say that if you look at this, this error, if, if you remember my simulation, I had some limit shape and I had some random shape fluctuating about this limit limit shape and this error is somehow those random fluctuations I'm seeing. And um, he said that if you divide by an explicit constant and scale with this very particular scaling, then it converges to a very special distribution of F, F2. distribution called the Tracy Widom distribution. <laughs> okay, so where does this Tracy Widom distribution um, arise? So let me describe this. Um, this way. So uh, in the center we have uh, first passage percolation. It was originally inspired by last passage, uh, sorry, uh, classical percolation, which I'll describe in a second. But this FPP turns out to belong to this huge class where these limiting fluctuations show up. And that's called the KPZ or KPZ uh, universality class. So when you say KPZ, do you mean one to three scaling? Uh, yes. Um, uh, I don't know how you see one, two, three scaling in FPP, but you'll see other, the same exp Sometimes exponents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK. So, how many of you have seen these letters KPZ recently? Not too many. Okay. So, uh, I can say a few things about this. This KPZ universality class has many, many interesting problems. It has uh, random matrices in it. And it has um, uh, some number theoretic questions in it. Uh, maybe I should just say zeta function zeros. And it has queuing, there's connections to queuing. There's connections to classical uh, integrable systems. Systems. KDV and so on, and so on. So I'll talk about uh, two of these. I'll just talk about random matrices and um, the zeta function. Okay. So um, this classical percolation theory was. Um, is an extremely interesting uh, model. Uh, maybe I won't go into it in the interest of time. Let me just describe this KPZ class. Okay. Okay. So this KPZ growth sort of models the growth of a random surface. So random surface and you have some blocks falling down on it, and so the surface is sort of evolving. 
or it shouldn't be a square block because it doesn't look smooth. It's like some some little crystals depositing on this random surface and this crystal uh, surface is growing. So this is usually described by a height function, HTX. HTX is the height at location X and X is usually one dimension. So these three physicists, Kardar, Parisi, and John wrote down an equation and described the behavior um, sort of intuitively or in physical terms for uh, such random in interfaces in, in, in wide generality. So Parisi won the, the Nobel Prize recently for this and other things. So dt htx is equal to d squared x htx plus one half dx h squared plus a random noise term. So noise. So uh, uh, this this term is, is sort of diffusive. This is um, some nonlinearity. And uh, this describes the evolution of the interface. So this equation has, um, has received a lot of attention because um, it's not um, a mathematically well posed to talk about its solutions. And um, uh, Martin Hyra was able to talk about its solutions. And there are many others who, who did some work before him, but um, uh, he's the one who won the uh, Fields Medal for it. Um, so it turns out that HTX um, goes CT plus um, C2, uh, T to the one third, um, uh, say C, and C has this F2 tracy rhythm distribution. There are many other aspects of this KPZ behavior that I'll touch upon as we uh, start talking about the flow x goes to this is this is as as t goes to infinity for fixed x. Um, uh, there is uh, x dependence. You can get processes in the limit. It's on the airy sheet. C1 C2 Sorry? C1 and C2, they depend on X or no? Uh, no, it's stationary. No, oh. they should not. So as long as you fix X, the asymptotics will be the same. Okay, okay, okay. Depends on the initial conditions, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Specific solvable model. Yes. Yes. yes, FPP, LPP. Do that. So of course, this 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 limit is supposed to be true for uh, LPP with any weights. So what exactly do you mean by universality class? Um, so by this I mean that um, um, these a huge bunch of growth models in some limiting sense are described by this, this continuum equation. We have all these little discrete models. If you scale them correctly, they'll go to this, this, um, this, this, this stochastic partial differential equation. And the behavior, the asymptotic behavior of this partial differential equation describes the asymptotic behavior of all models in this class. But um, this has only been proved for very, very, very few models. And so just these special solvable models. 
that they that they do that they are in fact described by the KPC equation. But the conjecture they made was that we should all have this universal behavior. Okay, uh, so the other famous example is, is the example of random matrices. Um, here, it was originally used by Wigner or Wigner to model um, uh, neutron scattering experiments. So basically the idea is this large quantum mechanical systems um, in this Heisenberg matrix mechanics can be described by matrices have no way to write down the elements of this matrix because there are too many interacting components in the system I can't describe the system. So Wigner said, let me just put random variables in a matrix and look at its spectrum and guess that it models in some sense uh, the energy levels of my quantum mechanical experiment. Sorry, that was very fast, but uh, I can clarify too. <laughs> Does that make sense? Doesn't make sense to me, but it works. Uh, yes, I'll describe them in a second. So um, I didn't want to talk about the physics, but I'll talk about the mathematical description. So be limiting the sorts of matrices that we Yes, uh, they are Hermitian, that's all. So I have some random variables, x1, x11, x12, so on, all the way to x1n. I put them into a matrix like this, and I just fill them, um, fill the, uh, uh, the upper triangular part of this matrix. And I take conjugate trans transpose. I'll say these are uh, these are complex valued random variables. IID uh, random variables. The real the real and imaginary parts are also independent. And then I uh, sort of symmetrize it or homotize it. Is it? and say A equals A star, just by copying um, and uh, uh, conjugating these random variables appropriately. And so uh, we know that such matrices have real eigenvalues. And I can look at their spectrum. And I'll arrange the spectrum like this, lambda one, lambda two, so on, all the way up to lambda n. They're all randomly placed on the line. So Wigner proved this sort of incredible theorem just by looking at the histogram of these eigenvalues and proved that if I look at the histogram, I make some bins, see how many of these eigenvalues fall in these bins, and so on. And Wigner proved that, in fact, the limiting shape of the histogram is a semicircle. It's called the semicircular law. So Wigner's semicircular law. So now it turns out that if I focus on lambda n and I look at its behavior, then lambda n, if I scale the entries of this matrix appropriately, I'm, I'm lying quite a bit, that they will grow as Cn plus C2 into the one third C and surprise, surprise, C has this F2 tracy distribution. I think most people have heard that story. And most people have also heard this next, or some people have heard this next 
um, part of this universality story. And that's to do with the zeta function. Okay. So here I take the zeta function um, and go back to the KP led model where you have the equation. Yeah. The growth model. Mm -hmm. so you said that one can't make sense of the equation, but subsequently after Martin Harrer, the interpretation of that, it is for that particular uh, solution that you have this technique of the basically don't. Uh, right, right. So to make sense of the solution of that, I think it actually goes back to Bertini and Giacomina. Um, but um, uh, so what was your question no, again? That, uh, so uh, when you say, does it make sense? What is the least How do you make sense? You you can make make sense of it as some sort of half coal solution or something something. I'm not not a complete expert in this area, so but you can. That solution, when you look at the growth of properties, you have this. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, okay. So now I want to look at the zeros of the zeta function on the critical line uh, one half. So if I focus on some window of say size n and I look at the zeros, then for example, many features of many statistical properties of the zeros have the same uh, statistical properties as the eigenvalues of a random matrix. Well, all you do is that you take all of these eigenvalues, um, you, you rotate them by 90 degrees and, and stick them on um, uh, this this window where you're looking at the zeros of the zeta function, and then um, one should expect them to have the same statistical properties. There's, um, in fact, a famous story where this um, sort of um, two-point correlation function, or loosely the gap between eigenvalues, uh, uh, in some sense, there's a function limiting function describing this, and the person who discovered this um, uh, Montgomery uh, was sitting in uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and he was telling the story to Freeman Dyson saying, oh, there's this function that I think describes the zeros of the zeta function, and Dyson's like, hold on, hold on, I know it, and, and he, st he states whatever that function is, and he's like, how did you know? He says it shows up everywhere in, in random matrix theory and physics. So um, that's my little spiel. I'm sure you've heard it from several people, but this was just to um, tell you that this problem is interesting and, and has lots of interesting connections. I sort of breezed through, through that too, so <laughs> I hope that was okay. Any questions about that? I can slow down and clarify any questions. I was thinking just about that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if the edge of this window actually goes to the theorem. No, uh, there is in the usual theta function, there is no edge. Right. You scale it out and uh, it looks like the bulk in the random matrix theory. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there is some other model where there is the. You could look at the edge of the window. But maybe not. No, that will not give. That will not give. You have to go high up in the critical line mm. and space out the zeros. That will look like the bulk. There is no edge in the inner zeta mm. of the L functions. Mm. I guess that's why they use CUE. Oh, yes. But the Tracy Jerome is there. In the Riemann zeta? zeta? No, it's not there. That's the that that was uh, Manju's question. Is there is there some analog of the edge case? Am I getting chat messages or? Oh, are there questions? Uh, uh, is there, let me check. Shall I log in and follow? Uh, mm -hmm. I think the chat is muted. I need to react. 
No, no, sir. Yeah, so please unmute yourself and ask. And it says, looks like something went wrong. We're trying to get you back. Okay. So the uh, the problem about zeros of the zeta function in some window of the critical line. It's belonging to the KTZ universality task is conjectural at the moment. Yes, yes. It, it depends on the Riemann hypothesis. So it's, yeah. it's really the uh, the but but the the pair correlation is there's nothing conjectural about the pair correlation, right? No, even that's conjectural. No, that's conjectural. It's you assume something about and in fact are these they are, they are, they are indeed. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know enough. I don't think so. No way, because it's some statistical behavior, right? So. But the reason is what the data function is because we want to show that the bulk property is the same as the random. I mean, there are many sort of. Um, Questions like this: Can you see some sort of geodesic properties in the random matrices um, because those geodesic properties are universal and so on? Can you see these random matrix properties in in the zeta functions? They're all good questions, and uh, they may be approachable in some way too. Okay, so um, back in some way to reality, and I'll talk about the main theorems about first passage perturbation. Um, so we talked about basic properties. So uh, you know it has the invariance under. So we're talking about time constant rather, not about, about mu of x, which was in fact this limit as n goes to infinity of the passage time from zero to x divided by n. And so it has a invariance under the symmetries of um, ZD. Um, for example, you have mu of minus x. And then if you rotate by 90 degrees, the, uh, uh, the time constant is invariant. Um, then other properties like convexity, uh, mu of lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y, Smaller than or equal to lambda mu of x. And the third property is homogeneity, one homogeneity, which is mu of lambda x, and that's equal to lambda mu of x. All of from, the definition of from the definition, two minutes or less. OK, so basic properties we know. The other is what Nishant mentioned, and that's. Yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, uh, I was about to suggest that you can remove the sidebar and top bar. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You don't need it. I don't need it. I don't need it. Uh, or maybe I'll put it in full screen also. How's that? I should have done this from the start. And maybe I'm even blocking the screen. Am I blocking the screen? No, I watched it. Oh, you can watch it. <laughs> It's quite a complicated yeah, setup. Yeah. <laughs> Much better now, okay. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk about the continuity of um, of of mu uh, and uh, the convergence. 
Uh, so I have some edge weights given by Fn. So these are edge weight distributions. And Fn converges to some F in distribution. Then uh, theorem for fixed X or any X X and RT, um, mu Fn of X uh, converges to mu F of X. So this is uh, a Cox and Kess. So this tells you that this mu F of X is quite a stable object. What else is known? And this is this famous theorem of uh, Cox and Dirac, and it's called the shape theorem. So various people talked about convergence of sets and so on, Hawthorne and Nishant, and it says the following. So in what sense, it's trying to answer the question, in what sense does DT this the shape divided by t converge this random shape converge and so this theorem is a famous theorem peter cox and durek maybe late 80s and it says the following uh, i think late 80s maybe 90s i can i can check um after keston for sure so after the 80s, after 86. Um, uh, actually, actually, no, <laughs> it is 81. So it's wrong about that. Okay, so it says the following. Uh, suppose uh, my moment condition is satisfied. E min over I um, equals 1 through 2D of Ti to the D is less than infinity. And 2, F0, my, my atom at the origin is less than PC, the critical probability for percolation. Population probability, bond population probability. Then I have um, then if B is the set X such that mu of X less than or equal to one. This is the level set. Of the, of the time constant. Um, then for every epsilon bigger than zero, we have the following statement. It says, sorry, I'm again forgetting about um, Gautam's request. It says P one minus epsilon B is contained inside uh, B sub T uh, contained inside B uh, for all large T. T equals So this is the statement of the theorem. In fact, it's an if and only if kind of statement, but I won't get into that. Okay, so this is the set of sense in which um, the limit shape, the scale limit shape uh, converge, uh, the scale uh, level set of the passage time converges to a limit. 
So eventually for all t large enough, the probability one, um, uh, it's contained inside um, a slightly ambiguous version of the limit shape and uh, and it also contains a smaller version of the limit shape. So another famous theorem. You know the answer for the question initially that f n converges to f, uh, then the shapes also converge to f n combine both the results. Uh, no, that was the previous theorem. The previous one, right? No, no, but that is mu, I think. But now we know that the limit shape is given by mu. You, you know the, the limit shape is. Mu, yes. So the yeah, yeah. convergence of sets will follow from this. Yes, this is, this is the. 2 and 3 together. Yeah. So, but mu is. Uh, mu is uh, one liquid or something. Uh, in as function of x. Yeah, yes, under some moment condition, yes. If bounded weights for sure it is. So. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about bounded weights. Sure. Okay, so an equivalent formulation is that um, is that limit x going to infinity of t zero x minus mu of x divided by x is equal to 0. Okay, so it's uniform in all directions. Okay. So I hope I can get my. X is the scaled thing or the unscaled? X, there's no one. There's, it's unscaled. X is unscaled. Ah, so that's a yes call. Uh, how do I get my toolbar back? Um, And this fourth theorem that is a uh, very interesting is about this this thing that grow the shape that grew like a it grew like a I'm talking like my four year old it grew like a um, um, <laughs> A diamond. Okay. So this is the Duret Leggett theorem, and this is one of the few concrete results um, we have. Okay. So let me explain. It says, suppose support of F is contained inside one infinity. One is not that important. <clears throat> and f of 1 is equal to p that's larger than or equal to uh, um, let me just write it this way f of 1 is equal to p and um, uh, let p sub c be the probability for directed percolation. Uh, it's just some number related to percolation theory. It's um, so maybe I'm, I'm way past my limit. So um, let me just finish stating this theory. Up to 340, OK. Yeah. I thought it was 330. Okay. No, no, there's a 10 minute break. Okay. OK, so um, why don't I tell you what these constants PCs uh, are about? Um, how many of you have seen classical per percolation? So very few. So let me let me tell you um, what it's about. So in classical percolation. You have these um, edge weights that you throw randomly 
on the edge uh, on the la on the edges of the lattice. Zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, and so on. And if this is the origin, I I ask for the probability, and I say uh, first let me say that p tau e equals um, um, uh, one is equal to p, and I let theta p be the probability that um, zero is connected to infinity. There is an infinite path of of uh, but of ones, um, and that this is called the percolation probability. So the classical theorems in this in this field say there's some PC between zero and one, such that theta p is zero until PC, and then suddenly jumps for p bigger than PC. To one. Right? And so this is an example of a phase transition. So it's called the emergence of a of a giant com, uh, component and things like that. Um, I've been I've seen you know people working in math bio or whatever um, show me simulations saying have you guys seen this before? And then suddenly a giant connected path will appear in percolation. It's really really. Um, really nice simulation to do by yourself. And the answer is always yes. We have seen this in population theory. It's really cool. So yeah, if you have time, you can do it on Mathematica 15 minutes. So now if I restrict. If I restrict to paths or rather if I say if um, if theta arrow P is p zero is connected to infinity by an upright path of ones um, then there exists p c hat and theta p uh, in zero one and theta p shows um, a similar phase transition. And so this is the P hat that I have here or P arrow that I have here. Vector P T C that I have here. So in this theorem due to direct and ligate, it says that um, let me draw a picture and tell you what it is. It's, it's much easier to do this way. It says um, if okay, let me establish some notation. Um, so I'm going to think of oops. so let um, B1 be the L1 ball. So that's X such that X1 equals one. So B1 is just this diamond. And then I'll define two points, MP and NP, uh, explicitly in terms of some function. So, in fact, I'll um, I'll just I'll just draw it like this. And then the result says that one, if P bigger than PC, where P was equal to f of zero, f of one. The, the atom one percolates, then B, my limit shape, intersection, um, I'm going to write it this way. It's one to infinity. And um, then this intersection is equal to using this terrible notation of this line segment between MP and NP. So now this shows that this sort of partially shows that this L1 like structure appears in my simulation. It proves that it appears for a certain class of measures. What is, your B here? What is my B here? B is the limit shape. So this guy is X such that 
mu of x less than or equal to 1. B1 is just the L1 norm. And now it's saying that they, their boundaries coincide in this cone. And this is called the percolation. So, of course, you, you have a symmetric picture on these uh, on, on all, in all four quadrants. And um, this is in, in B equals two. And two, if P equals PC, then B intersection DB1 equals the point one half, one half. And three, if P is less than PC, B is contained in Okay, so just pictorially, it's saying uh, yes, 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 yes. In the size of the population. Uh, no explicit formula as far as I know. Yeah, so P is less than PC, then you expect that uh, so I'm getting that the P is equal to PC, then it just the real just refers to use the uh, one the path with the path of ones, yeah. Exactly. And so that so that's why you have this directional in the uh, That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so I should have mentioned sort of geodesic. Yes. So what happens is when P is larger than PC, you have a giant component of ones. And it's sort of directed in these four directions. And any geodesic to a faraway point will mostly take once along this giant component. So that's the right intention. Do you mean it's contained in the interior not um, It contained in the interior. Maybe a better thing to say is, um, is in fact that. It's contained in Okay, so it's a beautiful theorem. It exploits connections to uh, contact process and uh, launching random walk and so on. Is it ligand? Du Durette and ligand. A few more things are known about measures in this class. Something missing from the notation. Uh, when you say scripting the function, you mean the boundary of the L1 ball. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that interval? Um, so that's shown in this picture. I'm I'm okay, sorry. So this is sort of foam. Foam. Yes. It's uh, it's just that line segment between MP and NP. So yeah, I, I'm happy to be explicit. I didn't want to write, write down equations of lines, so I. Okay, but then then I have then I'm confused about half two because half two looks very precise uh, because I assume NP and NP are the same length, are uh, are the endpoints of of the line segment. That's right, and um, so. So this is so. The the cone gets squeezed to a single point. And that's known, which is the incredible thing. And as P approaches one, does it cover the entire diameter? Yes, yes, yeah, cl yeah clearly. Yeah. So, what was the four thing? Like four intervals or only one? Four intervals. Ah, okay. uh, just by symmetry. Yeah, that is ah, symmetry. Okay. So, it's a union of. Um, union of four intervals. I've used this. Okay. I said, you no, know, the, the reason I. I spotted it because I didn't know if this was equal to two, and it seemed like two endpoints should be able to determine the cone would be the facet. <laughs> okay, this is equal to two. Sorry, I didn't see that. I don't, is there anything known, at least near critical behavior of the set MP and P is what you known there? Um, it's related to the growth of the contact process. 
so I, I i don't know exactly what's known there but if you know things there you can directly translate to yeah. Okay, so a few other interesting things are known because at this point it was not known whether it's actually a polygon or not. So, for example, we know it's flat, but what if we could just join these sections by by lines like this? Okay, I'll just stop. I'll just stop with this last thing. Okay. I'm done with all my basic results in first passage population, so I'll I'll, I'll take that as a win. Um, so you can in fact show that the shape is differentiable here. And that in fact, um, this is not a line and hence not a line. And not even many lines. So um, this was shown by uh, Marshan and Damon Alfinger, or Alfinger Damon, I should say. So you can just B. This B, so they sort of imply that B is not a polygon. Okay, so I'm done with whatever we know about this time constant, and um, in the next lecture, I'll talk about geodesics and Boosman functions and um, how they are related to the time constant and, and why they're interesting. Any other questions? Uh, if online anyone wants to talk, please unmute. So if there are no other questions, uh, let's meet again on Monday. Did you so, check the chat just in case? Uh, chat, I have to go out of it to check. That's why I asked them to unmute. Um, oh, okay. oh, there is something in the chat. Oh. Yeah. This is much better. This was one thing that we are missing. You can have said that when he shifted to full screen, he said it's so much better. There's what I remember from the chat. I think uh, it comes up uh, on the screen and then it comes. So, so the, second. So the second option I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, much better. Mm -hmm. Some people no, have more no than yeah. <laughs> Monkey is not allowing anyone to do anyone in the access. No time from the market.